welcome to my channel. My name is Erica. And in today's video, I am bringing you episode 10 of a true crime series I do here on my channel, True Crime in Oregon. I've always been very intrigued by true crime and I am from the state of Oregon. So I thought it would be interesting to combine those two things. Now I do try to bring these videos to you at least once a month, but over the past few months, Life has kind of gotten in my way, so they've been every other month. But I'm really going to try to adhere to my once a month schedule for my true crime videos. And also, I'll be bringing you cases from all over the world eventually. I just kind of decided that over the last couple of months. But I still had a couple of cases from Oregon that I wanted to bring to you guys. And this happens to be one of those cases. Now, this is the case of Ward Weaver III and the disappearances and murders of 12-year-old Ashley Pond and 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis. And all the information I'll be giving you in today's video came from this book right here. This is called The Missing Girls, A Shocking True Story of Abduction and Murder by Linda O'Neill, Philip Tennyson, and Rick Watson. Now, Linda O'Neill is loosely related to Ashley Pond through marriage. Philip Tennyson, her husband, is Ashley Pond's step-grandfather. And when the police investigation and the FBI investigation was going nowhere, the Pond family came to Linda O'Neill, who is a private investigator with years of investigative experience, and asked her if she would please do her own investigation into these girls' disappearances and ultimately their murders. And she agreed to do that. Now, she has been very criticized by the police force and the FBI agents that were a part of this investigation saying that she embellished details, that she lied about things, that she over-exaggerated some things. And I really do not believe that. I think she did an amazing job of investigating this case. Really excellent job. And she provides a lot of detail in this book. I will say that this book reads more like a novel, not so much like a true, true crime book. And the one thing I, I wasn't really expecting is that Linda does talk quite a bit about her personal life, kind of things that are going on in her personal life during the investigation. So some of that stuff I just kind of skimmed through because I, I really just wanted the details of her investigation. But extremely well written, tons of detail. I will have the link, the Amazon link to this book in my description box if it's still available. That's where I got this book. And if you're interested in getting more details of this case, more than I will be giving you in today's video, I highly recommend checking out this book. Now, as with all of my other true crime videos, I want to give you a huge disclaimer here. Viewer discretion is absolutely advised. I'm going to be detailing some very violent sexual crimes. And obviously these crimes have to do with a 12 year old and a 13 year old girl. Uh, this is not easy for me to talk about. It will not be easy for you to listen to. And I do really appreciate your time if you do decide to stick around and watch and listen to this video. But I would not have young viewers around while you're doing so. So without any further ado, let's get into the case of Ward Weaver III. Ward Francis Weaver III was born on April 6, 1963 in Humboldt County, California to Trish and Ward Weaver Jr., but he was known to friends and family as Pete. Now, Pete was not a kind man. He was extremely verbally and physically abusive to both Ward and his sister Tammy and was a raging alcoholic. And in 1967, Pete did abandon the family to eventually remarry another woman and they had a son together by the name of Rodney. Now, Trish also remarried to a man named Bob Boudreau and together they had another son named Robert. Now, Bob was another raging alcoholic and was just as abusive as Pete was, both verbally and physically. So Ward was raised his entire life by very verbally and physically abusive alcoholic men. Now, this began a lifelong distrust and hatred and anger towards his mother, Trish. He felt like she would rather put these men, these alcoholic abusive men, before the safety of her own children. When Ward was in his early teens, his stepfather took a job in Portland, Oregon and relocated the family there. Now this was when Ward started to show some pretty antisocial traits, not only at home, but at school. He started to be very physically abusive towards his siblings. Uh, his brother Robert reported that Ward would frequently physically attack him. And his sister Tammy also reported that at age 12, 
Ward started to sexually abuse another female family member. Now, when Ward entered into Marshall High School in Portland, Oregon, he started to run with a pretty rough crowd. He started drinking, taking drugs, and being very antisocial in class, with his peers, with his teachers, basically towards any authoritarian figure in his life. And in 1981, shortly before he graduated from high school, he viciously raped and beat a female relative. And even though the police got involved with this crime, he had enlisted in the Navy. So the police felt like, well, Ward's going to be leaving town soon with the Navy and he'll be away from her and she'll be safe. So let's just kind of sweep this under the rug and nothing was done about it. Now, ironically, at this exact same time, Pete Weaver, Ward Weaver's biological father, was engaging in his own series of violent and tragic crimes. Pete was now a long haul truck driver, still a raging alcoholic and still a very violent man. And on the night of February 6th, 1981, Pete happened to be driving his truck through Tehachapi, California and came upon a couple who had broken down on the side of the freeway. They were 18-year-old Air Force recruit Robert Radford and his 23-year-old girlfriend Barbara Lavoy. So Pete stopped and offered them a ride to nearby Mojave. Now about five miles down the road, Pete says, you know what, I can tell there's something wrong with what I'm carrying in the back. I'm going to pull over to the side and get out and shift some things around. And he asked Robert for his help. So of course Robert agrees to do that. So they pull over, both men get out of the truck, they go around to the back, and as Robert is bending over to shift some things around, Pete picks up a lead pipe and beats him viciously in the back of the head, leaving his crumpled body on the side of the road. Uh, he was later discovered and taken to the hospital where he died from his injuries. So Pete gets back into the truck and forces Barbara to put her head between her knees and ties both arms behind her back. Now he's headed to San Francisco to drop off whatever he's hauling in his truck and rapes her repeatedly on the way to San Francisco. Uh, he gets there, he drops off whatever it is that he's delivering and then takes her back to his home in Oroville, California. He proceeds to take her into his bedroom that he shares with his wife, viciously rapes her and strangles her to death. He then digs a hole out in the backyard and buries her and proceeds to meet his wife out for dinner. Now, eventually, Pete builds a wood and concrete structure over where he's buried Barbara, unbeknownst to anyone. Now, it ended up taking close to two years for the police to solve the murders of Robert Radford and Barbara Lavoy and to find Barbara's body. Now, Pete had an extensive history of sexual violence and was known amongst the local trucking community for doing this. He would frequently harass couples that had broken down on the side of the road. He had been suspected in several rapes of other young women. And he did finally go to trial and was convicted of both of their murders and was sentenced to death row and was sent to San Quentin Prison in California. And Pete Weaver is actually a suspect or a person of interest in up to 24 other murders. Now, back to Ward Weaver III, uh, where we left off, he had just enlisted in the Navy. Now, his time in the Navy was pretty short-lived. Uh, he was in the Navy for about a year, but was discharged due to his heavy drinking and dereliction of duty. But while he was in the Navy, he met a woman who would become his first wife, Maria Stote, who was a native of the Philippines. Now, not long after Ward was discharged from the Navy, Maria became pregnant. And when she was five months pregnant with their son, Ward beat her so viciously that she ended up being hospitalized. And she was so terrified of what he would do to her that she never pressed charges and she ended up going back with him. Now in 1982, she did give birth to their first son, Francis. And in 1984, the family relocated to Bakersfield, California. And unfortunately, the spousal abuse continued. Maria was extremely physically, mentally, and sexually abused by Ward and he became a full-blown alcoholic. Now, over the course of a few years, Maria did give birth to two more boys and a daughter by the name of Mallory. In 1986, Ward was finally arrested for brutally physically attacking a 16-year-old daughter of one of his friends. Now, Ward had been down at the local bowling alley and had gotten so drunk and so high that he could not drive home. So he called his friend and asked for a ride. Now, his friend's daughter just turned 16, just gotten her driver's license. 
She was super excited to go pick Ward up and take him home. And she loved Ward. Most of the kids that were around Ward just loved him because he was kind of like the life of the party. So she takes her younger sister and they drive down to the bowling alley to pick Ward up and take him home. But as they're on the way back to his house, he starts to come on to her sexually and she fights him off and tells him to stop. And he just loses his temper, tells her to pull the car over, which she does. He proceeds to get out, pull her out of a vehicle and beats her over the head with a concrete block. Now, fortunately, both girls were able to get away. They ran to a nearby home and called the police. The police came and arrested him, and ultimately, he served three years in prison for that crime. Now, after his release, he did attempt to live a clean life. He was sober, he was clean, he was trying to do like a complete 180, and he relocated his family to Canby, Oregon, which is a suburb town outside of Portland. And that is where Mallory, his daughter, was born. But by 1993, Ward was right back to his old violent alcoholic ways. And finally, Maria had had enough of the abuse. She filed a restraining order and then filed for a divorce. In 1995, Ward met another woman by the name of Christy Sloan, and he was just as physically, mentally, and sexually abusive to her as he was to his wife, Maria. And actually, in July of that year, he beat her viciously over the head with a cast iron skillet in front of all four of his children. He was granted custody of all four of his children. Now, he was arrested and jailed for that crime, but Christy was so terrified of him that she refused to testify against him, and he was able to convince her to get back together with him and to help him raise his four children. And in 1996, they were married, and their marriage lasted for about four years. But again, his treatment of her was so horrific with the violence, the alcoholism, and she just could not take it anymore. So just like Maria, she did file a restraining order against him, was finally able to safely get away and stay away and filed for divorce. But Ward was not single for long. He was already having an affair with another woman. So he took his four kids and moved in with her in Oregon City on South Beaver Creek Road. In 2001, Ward's youngest child, Mallory Weaver, was 12 years old and started to attend sixth grade at Gardner Middle School. And this is where she befriended 12-year-old Ashley Pond, who was born March 1st, 1989, and 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis, who was born November 11th, 1988. Now, all three girls were on the same dance team together, and they just had the time of their lives. They loved to dance. Ashley was known to just love to spend time with her younger siblings. She always had at least one of her younger siblings in tow, like on her hip, carrying them around. She loved to dance. She loved music. She loved to laugh. And so did Miranda. Miranda also had some younger siblings. And the three of them together were just known to be this giggly gaggle of girls. As the girls' sixth grade year came to an end, Ashley and her mother, Lori, started to fight quite often. Lori was known to have a bit of a drinking problem, uh, there were other kids in the household, and Ashley always felt like she never had her mother's undivided attention. Not only that, but Lori had recently divorced Ashley's birth father, Wesley. And so she was having a lot of men coming in and out of the house, a lot of boyfriends, kind of a revolving door for men. And Ashley just could not stand that. So she started to be a bit of a smart mouth, talk back. And so they were known to have some very loud, raucous fights in the apartment. Uh, holes were punched in doors and into walls. The neighbors of the Newell Creek Village apartment complex where they lived would frequently report fighting. The police were called quite often. And so Ashley on many occasions would pack a bag and just walk down the street and stay with her friend, Mallory Weaver. Now, of course, her father is Ward Weaver. And it became so frequent that as time went on, Ashley ended up spending months with Mallory Weaver at Ward Weaver's house. Now, Ward appeared to the outside world as this doting father figure to Ashley. You know, everyone thought he was doing this great deed by allowing this troubled young woman to come and stay with his daughter and basically live there. You know, he was taking her to school, taking her to dance team practice, taking her out to dinner, buying her things, you know, being like a substitute father in her life. And Ward was allowing Mallory and Ashley and Miranda and several of their other girlfriends to have parties at his house on the weekends, furnishing them with alcohol and pot. 
Now, his excuse behind this was that he was just letting the girls get a little bit tipsy and that it was much better for them to be at his house so that he could keep an eye on them and they weren't running the streets, drinking and smoking pot. And other parents knew that this was going on and they just allowed it to happen. Now, as time went on and Ashley, of course, was spending all of her time over there, she began to really love and trust Ward and look at him like a father figure. And he just showered her with attention and affection and with gifts and was always there for her. And eventually, Ashley felt comfortable enough to confide in him a secret that she'd been keeping for quite some time. She shared with him that her father, Wesley, was molesting her and had been for quite some time. So Ward takes Lori, Ashley's mother, and Ashley down to the police station where they report this abuse, and Wesley is arrested and charged with 39 charges of child molestation against Ashley. And the fact that Ward did this for her, she like looks at him almost as like a hero. She just wants to devote her whole life to him because finally a man has believed her, has showered her with love and affection, and she just really wants to do anything and everything to make him happy. And he takes full advantage of this. He takes the fact that she is so vulnerable and so defenseless and just turns into an absolute predator and begins to groom her. And what starts happening is that Ward has Ashley sleep in his bed with him and has his live-in girlfriend go and sleep on the sofa bed in the garage. Not only that, but right before the seventh grade school year starts, he takes the whole family on a trip to California to visit his mother and stepfather and brings Ashley along. And on the way down there, he makes it so that just he and Ashley are riding in a car together and the live-in girlfriend takes the rest of the kids down with her. And when they get to the hotel that they're staying in, he and Ashley stay in the hotel room alone while the live-in girlfriend stays with the other kids in another hotel room. Now, the seventh grade school year is in full swing, and towards the end of September, one of Ashley's school teachers looks out the window as Ward is dropping Ashley off for school, and she sees the two of them passionately kissing in the front seat of his truck, and she cannot believe her eyes. She watches Ashley get out, and she kind of like blows him a kiss and walks in like, like a girlfriend would, and she's just thinking, no way, this cannot be going on. So she pulls Ashley into her office and she says, Ashley, what, what's going on here exactly? And she starts to tell this teacher that like she and Ward are in love with each other and that she sleeps in the same bed with him at night. And the teacher is just like, no. And she instantly reports this to the police, which I'll get to that report here uh, throughout the video, later on in the video. Then in October, things really start to change with Ashley. She starts really pulling away from Mallory and from Ward. And there are several times where she goes and stays with her stepmother, who she's very close to. Her father is still in jail over the molestation charges. And she confides in her stepmother that when Ward took her to California, that he attempted to rape her in the hotel room and that she was able to stop him from doing that, but that she's really afraid of him and that she knows that if she continues to be around him alone, that he is going to successfully rape her. So her stepmother reports that to the police as well, which I'll get to that report later on in the video also. And basically just really encourages Ashley to stay away from Ward Weaver. Now, Ashley does confide in Miranda Gaddis, her very good friend, and also uh, to a couple other girls on the dance team, that Ward is sexually abusing her. And they start talking amongst themselves, and word spreads pretty quickly, and it gets back to Mallory. Mallory, in turn, goes and tells Ward what Ashley is saying. And of course, Ward gets very angry and very vengeful and starts telling anyone and everyone that Ashley is a liar, that he would never do this to her. Why would he take her and her mother down to the police station to report the abuse of her father and then turn around and sexually abuse her? She's just, you know, like mixing the two things together. He would never do that to her. All he's ever done is shown her love and support and has been a father to her. How dare she say this about him? So basically what he does is he convinces these girls to shun her, to ostracize her, to not have anything to do with her. 
And as the holidays come, you know, Thanksgiving into Christmas, Ashley is feeling extremely alone and ostracized and doesn't know what to do. So she goes back over to the Weaver household and, and tries her best to smooth things over with Ward. But on the morning of January 9th, 2002, 12 year old Ashley Pond went missing from her school bus stop. Now she was reported missing that afternoon by her mother, Lori, around 3.30, when all of her kiddos got home from school, but Ashley was not with them. Now the 911 call that she made was under quite a bit of scrutiny as the investigation went on because there was some differing information that Lori gave the dispatch. So there was a chance that Ashley actually went missing the night before rather than the morning at the bus stop. Now, initially the police saw this as a potential runaway because Ashley had been telling anyone that would listen to her that she really wanted to run away from her home. So for the first 48 to 72 hours, that, that's kind of what they were suspecting. And they kept, they kept telling Lori, you know, Ashley's gonna come home. She just got angry, she ran away. Let's all calm down, she will come back. But after about four or five days when Ashley still had not returned, there was no doubt that something awful had happened to Ashley. And at that point, the investigation really took off. Now, to begin with, they were really focusing on the Newell Creek Village Apartments. Uh, interviewing all of their neighbors, upstairs, downstairs, to the left, to the right, I mean, the whole apartment complex, anyone and everyone they were questioning, and they were just coming up with no leads. There was a female officer who did an amazing job throughout this investigation, who actually then went to Ashley's school and chatted with as many of her friends as she possibly could. And at that point was when this officer started to hear about the relationship between Ashley and Ward Weaver and her blood just ran cold. So there were some officers that did go over to Ward Weaver's house and they did question him and he was very open and allowed them to come into his home, allowed them to search, uh, had no problem answering all of their questions. Eventually he did go down to the police station and took a lie detector test, which he passed. So at this point, he really wasn't on the police officers or the police investigation radar, except for this one female officer. She was pretty thoroughly convinced that Ward Weaver did have something to do with Ashley's disappearance. Now, by mid-February, the entire community had done several searches for Ashley and had come up empty. Now, Ward Weaver was continuing to have these parties for Mallory and her girlfriends. And at one particular party, there was another young girl that was at Ward Weaver's house that he was treating exactly the same way that he had treated Ashley. He was showering her with affection and attention, wooing and definitely grooming her. And Miranda Gaddis was watching this and got very concerned for this young girl's safety because of course, Ashley had confided in Miranda about all the abuse that she was experiencing from Ward Weaver. And so at this party, Miranda pulls this young girl aside and says, you need to be really careful. You know, he sexually abused Ashley and now Ashley is missing. Like, you need to stay away from him. Well, unfortunately, Mallory, Ward's daughter, overheard that conversation and went and told Ward. And Ward, in a fit of rage, basically just kicked Miranda out of his house and told her she was never welcome there and to never come back. And on the morning of March 8, 2002, Miranda Gaddis also went missing from the school bus stop under the same exact circumstances as Ashley Pond. She had just disappeared into thin air, just like Ashley. Now, of course, an even larger investigation is going on, encompassing both girls, but there are no leads, no suspects. It just keeps running cold over and over and over again. So Lori Pond, Ashley's mother, in a moment of desperation, reaches out to Linda O'Neill, which is her stepfather's wife. So it's Ashley Pond's step-grandmother through marriage. It's kind of a confusing story, but she knows that Linda is a very good, a stellar private investigator. So she reaches out to Linda and she says, Linda, I need your help. The police are getting nowhere. It's been over two months now since Ashley has been missing. It's been weeks since Miranda has been missing. We need help. And can you please help us? And at first, Linda, you know, she has other cases and she just, 
She's not sure that she can manage this, but she knows Ashley. She's been around Ashley and she loves this little girl. So she's like, absolutely, I will drop my other cases or at least minimize my other cases and jump with both feet into investigating the disappearance of Ashley and Miranda. So Linda starts questioning some people and right away she comes into contact with a local man that has a search and rescue uh, business and he has his own search and rescue dog. Now, unbeknownst to Linda, Lori has already sought this guy's help. Uh, she went to him with an article of Ashley's clothing and she said, will you please take this dog, uh, see if this dog can pick up Ashley's scent and see where it leads you. And so he does that. He takes a sweatshirt of Ashley's. Um, he has the dog smell the sweatshirt and the dog immediately takes off for Ward Weaver's property. Races right to the backyard to his back shed and also stands right on top of a concrete slab that Ward Weaver has recently laid down in his backyard for the base of a hot tub. And this dog does a death signal, a death howl, alerting the owner that there is could potentially be a dead body under this concrete slab. Now, this gentleman had gone down to the police station to report this and was basically just turned away. He was told, you know what, we've already investigated Ward Weaver, we've been to his house, we've searched his property, and there's no reason for us to think that Ward Weaver has anything to do with the disappearance of Ashley or Miranda. So when Linda finds out this piece of information, she is like, oh my God, what, what, what's, what in the world's going on here? Why wouldn't they do anything with that information? So Linda starts really looking into Ward Weaver's life, and she interviews both of his ex-wives, she also interviews his live-in girlfriend and starts to really piece together the very unhealthy relationship that Ward and Ashley had. Uh, she finds out about the fact that Ashley was sleeping in bed with him, that his girlfriend was made to sleep out in this on the sofa bed in the garage. Uh, she also ends up talking to his ex-wives about how abusive and violent and what a raging alcoholic he was. She also finds out about his father, his birth father, Pete's violent past as well. And the fact that he poured a slab of concrete over a body, the body of 23 year old Barbara Lavoie in his backyard. And she's starting to piece that together with the concrete slab that Ward has recently poured in his backyard. And she's just thinking, I, I, the police aren't seeing this. How is it possible that the police are not putting two and two together here? Now, Linda also goes and interviews the teacher that witnessed Ashley and Ward passionately kissing in the front seat of his truck on the morning that he dropped Ashley off for school. She also goes and talks to uh, Ashley's stepmother. And what she finds out is that after Ashley had uh, told people that Ward was molesting her and had attempted to rape her, that Ward went down to the police station and convinced the police that Ashley was lying about the report that she gave them about her own birth father and that they limited the charges of molestation against Ashley from her own father from 39 down to two charges and that he was gonna spend a very minimal amount of time in jail and would be released. Now, the stepmother left Wesley, of course, and she was very close with Ashley and did believe that he had done this to her and was just heartbroken over the fact that Ashley was missing. And she told Linda, Ashley confided in me that Ward was molesting her. And, and she, you know, this woman says, I, I know that he was taking full advantage of this situation. He was preying on the vulnerabilities and the brokenness of this poor little girl. And she said, I have no doubt in my mind that Ward Weaver is behind the disappearance of both Ashley and Miranda. Now, as this case continued to go on, it started to gain national attention. There was actually a People Magazine article written about the disappearance of both Ashley and Miranda. And as Linda continued to compile all of the evidence that she was gathering, she made like a dossier with all this information. And she went and sat down with the main FBI agents and the main police officers that were investigating this case. And she presented them with all of this information. And they kind of looked through it and basically just laughed in her face and turned her away and told her that she was basically interfering with their investigation and to stay out of it. That she really didn't know what she was talking about. 
she didn't have the same resources that they did, and that Ward Weaver was just not a viable suspect in the disappearance of either of these young girls. Now, something else that was happening around this time is that the public was really starting to turn on Lori and Michelle, Miranda's mother. Uh, they were talking about the fact that uh, these women were not good mothers, that it was ultimately their, their fault that these girls had gone missing. Why weren't they keeping better track of their own daughters? And this really forced both Lori and Michelle to become very reclusive. They just kind of walled themselves up in their apartments and stopped talking to anyone, stopped going out anymore, uh, to the point where eventually Lori Pond and her boyfriend and all of her children end up moving to a different town. Uh, that, that happens later on. But I mean, the, the public is just vicious attacking these two women and blaming them, solely blaming them for the disappearance of these two young girls. Now, Linda is just kind of coming to the end of her rope. She just doesn't know what else to do. She is firmly convinced, as is this female police officer, that Ward Weaver is at the heart of these two girls' disappearances. So she starts thinking about how to like flush Ward Weaver out, maybe like put him in the media spotlight and see if maybe he will trip himself up with his own words here. Maybe like start casting doubt upon himself. So she reaches out to a reporter for the Oregonian that she's very good friends with. And she said, I'm gonna give you this information. I want you to tell me what you think of this guy. So he looks through all the information that she's gathered and he's like, well, he's guilty. And she's like, yeah, no kidding. So he said, well, well let, let's do something about this. He said, why don't I go down to Ward Weaver's house on South Beaver Creek Road and interview him and see what I can get him to say. Linda's like, that sounds fantastic. So this gentleman goes down to Ward Weaver's house. Ward magnanimously lets him in, sits him down and has this like two hour long interview with him. And Ward starts telling this reporter that he is the prime suspect that he is the only person that they've ever suspected of kidnapping both Ashley and Miranda and that they think he murdered both girls. Well, that, that's not at all what they're thinking. Not at all. And that, uh, you know, he doesn't know what to do and he's thinking he's probably gonna have to move away because this is gonna haunt him for the rest of his life and on and on and on. Now, at the end of July is when this article is published in the Oregonian. Now it's been six months since Ashley has gone missing and four months since Miranda has gone missing. And finally, with the story that Ward has given that he's the prime suspect and that the police are hot on his trail and think that he's the only person that could have done this to these girls. And also all the other facts, that all the other evidence that Linda has gathered over the course of her investigation, that's all now on in print. The public finally starts to see Ward Weaver for who he is and the tide starts to shift away from the mothers and the blame starts to be focused more on Ward Weaver where it belongs. Now, the police are also starting to get more suspicious of Ward Weaver, but they're still not really going after him as they should. But on August 13th of 2002, Ward Weaver commits another crime and finally his whole facade caves in on him. Ward has had his driver's license suspended and he needs a ride to the courthouse for a court hearing. And he has his oldest son's girlfriend, Emily, give him a ride to the courthouse. But on the way to the courthouse, he wants her to stop at his home that he is currently moving out of because he's heading to Mexico uh, because he forgot some of his paperwork there. So uh, she accompanies him into the home and out of nowhere, he viciously attacks her, strangles her almost to death and rapes her. Now, somehow she is able to get away from him completely naked and runs outside down the street where this gentleman picks her up and in a panic, she just says, take me to this local strip mall to get to a phone. So he does that. He takes her to a strip mall. She gets out, races into a store, um, is ushered into the back by the people working there and is able to call the police. And soon after that, uh, Ward Weaver is arrested and taken to jail. Now, at this point, there's a couple things that happen that finally completely derail Ward Weaver. Number one, his son, Francis, who his girlfriend, his father had just raped. Now this woman is the mother of his son, the mother of Ward Weaver's grandson, is just absolutely furious that his father has done this to this woman that he loves so much. 
So he calls the police and he says, I'm going to be completely honest with you. My father confessed to me that he killed both Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis. And I am positive that both of their bodies are buried somewhere here on our property. Not only that, but Linda O'Neill, Lori Pond, and Michelle Duffy, Miranda's mother, gather a pretty big media presence and go down to Ward Weaver's home with these big signs that say justice for Ashley and Miranda. Another sign says, dig me up, referring to the concrete slab that he had poured in the backyard. And while they're filming this, this is of course getting national attention, there's a gentleman there with a dog and this dog races across the yard and goes into a shed that's on the very back part of Ward Weaver's property. And when the man goes to collect the dog, he walks into the shed and is instantly hit in the face by the smell of death. And he looks up at the ceiling and there are uh, big rounds of fly tape hanging down, just covered with flies. There's all of these deodorant trees hanging. And it's obvious that there's something that has died in the shed. So of course that is immediately reported to the police. Now they have no other choice now than to start listening to these reports and they issue a search warrant and go and search the shed on Ward Weaver's property where they find the dead body of 13 year old Miranda Gaddis. She was found naked and basically stuffed in a ball into a plastic bag that was put into a box which was wrapped in a plastic bag and that was put into a microwave box that was wrapped in a plastic bag and ultimately they found a fingerprint of Ward Weaver's on the inside bag the bag that Miranda was initially placed in now she was ultimately identified by her dental records and the medical examiner said that at some point after her death she was stored in a deep freezer now, eventually, the search warrant included the breaking up of the concrete slab where Ashley Pond's body was found. Uh, her mummified body was bound in rope and inserted into a barrel that was under a layer of rock under the concrete slab. Now, it was also determined by the medical examiner that she was also kept in a deep freezer for quite some time before her body was deposited into the barrel. And of course, they did find the freezer on Ward Weaver's property. And also in Ward Weaver's home, they found a pair of Ashley's Skecher tennis shoes, all of Miranda Gaddis's clothing that she was wearing on the day she went missing, and also Miranda's school books. Now, of course, Ward denies all of this. He says he has absolutely nothing to do with this, that he was framed, that he thinks his oldest son planted the bodies in the shed and under the concrete slab, uh, goes to these desperate measures of uh, involving a local TV news anchor and a song to come down to the jail and interview him where he goes on and on and on about all these possible case scenarios as to why Miranda and Ashley's bodies ended up underneath the concrete slab and in the shed. And he just makes a complete ass out of himself. I mean, he just goes round and round in different circles, has all these very far-fetched ideas about what he thinks happened to these girls. And really, he just kind of does himself in. Uh, that, does, that does go on to the news and, you know, national news, I, I think, eventually. And, you know, obviously, he is seen as the huge liar that he is. I mean, he, you can just see right through him. Absolutely. Ward Weaver continually plays games throughout the court proceedings. And it just uh, delays the trial and delays the trial and delays the trial. He attempts to commit suicide by giving himself very superficial wounds with this makeshift knife in his arm and in his chest. Uh, they end up putting him at the Oregon State Hospital in Salem to determine whether or not he is sane enough to stand trial. And fortunately, after he's been interviewed by several psychologists, they do determine that, yes, he's completely sane and he does know the difference between right and wrong. And this is all very histrionic behavior. He's just doing his best to delay what's coming to him. Uh, he ends up firing his first lawyers. Uh, then he gets new uh, court appointed lawyers and they don't want to defend him because they totally believe that he's guilty and he's being so obstinate and so hard to work with that they are like wanting to quit and the judge is like no you have to continue to defend him we don't want him to defend himself he needs a defense so finally 
after all this time goes on, years go by, in September of 2004, Ward finally changes his plea to guilty, and he is charged with multiple counts of aggravated murder, abuse of a corpse, and sexual abuse. And ultimately, he is sentenced to two life sentences to run consecutively. Now, a few things did come to light after Ward was sentenced to life in prison, two life sentences in prison. Number one, they did a DNA test with his son, Francis, and discovered that Francis was not his biological son. And also, the police started to look into the reports that the teacher had made about Ward abusing Ashley and also that uh, Ashley's stepmother had made about uh, Ward abusing Ashley. And what they determined is that there were reports made, but they were faxed to the wrong department. They had gone to like the sheriff's department and not to the child services division. And so at the time, the governor of Oregon was John Kitzhaber. And he did an absolute overhaul of how child abuse cases were reported. There was a mandatory 24-hour response to a report. So if uh, somebody reported child abuse, uh, the caseworker had 24 hours and only 24 hours to respond. And if they didn't do that, they could lose their job. Now, ultimately, all of the people who handled these reports were fired from the Children's Services Division. But as time went on, all of these people were rehired back to their job, not their former positions, but they were rehired back by the uh, Child Services Division. And that just absolutely blew my mind. And I do remember hearing about John Kitzhaber really nailing down the reporting system. And uh, I, for some reason, I didn't put two and two together that this was the case that prompted all of that. But he had a very successful and huge reform of the reporting system and also just child services division. And I, I understand that's a really hard job. There are so many cases of abuse and there's not enough people handling all these cases of abuse. But I truly believe that if that had been handled correctly, handled properly, and that had been sent to the proper agencies, that Ward, I, I, I mean, I don't know, it's ridiculous to go back in time because we can't do that. But I, I really believe that if it had been handled appropriately, that Ashley and Miranda's disappearances and murders would never have happened because I think he would have been arrested for it. In 2007, Ward was on his way to the prison barber to have his hair cut. And the barber had made a makeshift knife and stabbed Ward repeatedly in the arm and the shoulder. He did make a full recovery from that. And also in 2009, Miranda's younger sister, Mariah, went and met with Ward Weaver. She just wanted to ask him why he had done this to her sister. And Ward admitted to her face to face that he had killed both Ashley and Miranda with his bare hands and that his plans ultimately were that he was going to go after Mariah next and kill her. Uh, after Ward was arrested, his daughter Mallory uh, was seeing him quite frequently. Um, he was really pushing uh, like weekly visits with her. And she was agreeing to those at first. And she was also staying with her Aunt Tammy, Ward's sister. But Ward and Tammy had a very unhealthy relationship. And the police started to really see, and, and also his lawyers and Mallory's lawyer, started to really see that Mallory and Ward's relationship was not good, that he was very controlling, uh, very threatening, and they really wanted to curtail her visits to see her father. So eventually those visits stopped, and uh, by all accounts, Mallory was adopted by a very loving foster family. But in 2010, Mallory Weaver was arrested for assaulting a hospital security guard, but eventually was found not guilty. And in 2016, Francis Weaver was sentenced to life in prison for a horrible drug deal gone bad. Uh, he and some friends of his had kidnapped a drug dealer to try to steal like several pounds of marijuana. And ultimately, this drug dealer was killed. Francis did not kill him, but was uh, a party to the killing or was, uh, was present when the killing took place. So he was sentenced to life in prison. And uh, at the end of the book, what was written is that Lori Pond and her boyfriend and Ashley's other siblings had moved to a different town and so had Michelle Duffy. They just started over uh, other places in Oregon. And of course, I wanna give you guys my two cents in this case. Uh, I was just in a state of shock that the police and the FBI never really suspected Ward Weaver from the very beginning. 
they knew a lot of the details that, you know, Ashley had uh, accused him of abusing her. Uh, they, you know, they talked to a lot of her friends. They talked to her stepmother. You know, they talked to a lot of different people and still didn't pursue him as a viable suspect. And to me, it was like this, you know, glaring red flag, red light, bing, 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 this beacon of light pointing right at him the entire time. And I just was really happy that Lori uh, had Linda start her own investigation. Because I don't know, if, if Linda hadn't done her own investigation, I'm not sure that Ward Weaver would have ever been found guilty of these crimes. I don't know that those bodies would ever be found. And, you know, you look at Ward Weaver's father, Pete, that he basically did the same exact thing to Barbara Levoy, 23-year-old Barbara Levoy. I mean, just unbelievable that this went on for months, months and months this went on. I mean, from the time that, you know, uh, Ashley went missing in January, then Miranda goes missing in March, you know, it takes him committing this other heinous crime of his son's girlfriend before he's even arrested and even looked at as a, as a viable suspect, you know, just unbelievable. And I know that Ward came from a very abusive home, just like most of these other cases that I've covered uh, in these videos. I know that, but there's no excuse for what he did. However, I will say that if he had had early intervention, intervention way early on, like I mentioned, he had raped a woman when he, right before he graduated from high school. And well, let's just let him go off into the Navy. Let's not arrest him. Let's not pursue any charges. He'll go away. She'll be safe. I mean, you know, his entire life, he was showing these awful, violent tendencies and nothing was really done about it. It's, it's so reactive and not proactive. And that's the theme that I find with all of these stories. And my heart is so broken for the loss of these two beautiful, young, innocent lives and their families having to go on with their lives without these beautiful young women in their lives. I cannot even imagine. It absolutely breaks my heart. I am just really glad that he's in prison for the rest of his life. Uh, he's not eligible for any kind of parole. Neither is his father. I think his father actually still is alive on death row in San Quentin in California. And I believe Ward Weaver is housed at the Snake River Correctional Institute here in Oregon, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, neither one of them will get out and thank God. So let me know if any of you were familiar with this case. We can chat about that in the comment section. I'm going to do my best to have another case ready for you in April. I'm not sure, but I'm hoping I can. Uh, I really do appreciate you guys taking time out of your day or night to sit down and watch this and listen to this. I know this is not easy. It's very difficult. So I really appreciate your time. And until I see you again, please take very good care of yourself and I'll see you soon.